Welcome back to the Mental Game of Poker podcast. I'm your host, Jared Tendler. Excited to be back recording this show. And I'm also very excited because I've got a fantastic guest today, one who needs no introduction, Daniel Negreanu. Uh, as many of you know, I've taken roughly the last three months uh, from recording the show, and it's because my wife and I gave birth to a daughter, Teddy Michelle. Uh, both uh, her and my, my wife are doing very well, and I want to thank everybody for the uh, well wishes. Uh, fatherhood is pretty exciting and pretty amazing, has its ups and downs, uh, but it's been a lot of fun, and I feel very lucky that I get to work from home and get to see her a lot and really get to enjoy spending time with her. As I mentioned, my guest today is Daniel Negreanu, and I'm always interested in delving into the mind of an elite performer like Daniel, but I was particularly interested in interviewing him because in recent years he's made a very public commitment to self-improvement, and that seemingly has had a positive connection with his poker results, uh, but certainly it has had a positive impact on his life. So this is one of the more kind of self-help, uh, personal a focused podcast that I've done, uh, but I think there's a lot of interesting things uh, to hear both from that end uh, and as, uh, from a poker side of things uh, from Daniel. Uh, we talk about his approach to learning and how he's really been open to feedback, uh, the importance of taking personal responsibility and, and not getting into that victim mentality, and the importance that uh, of setting goals uh, and how that's been crucial to his poker success. And I, I think you're going to find particularly interesting our discussion about positive thinking. Uh, Daniel and I have some differing perspectives on that, uh, but of course we find common ground, and I think the discussion is really high level, uh, and I think you'll enjoy it. Now, for those of you who are new to the podcast or have still not picked up a copy, uh, The Mental Game of Poker 1 and 2 is on audiobook, and you can get the book for free uh, through audible.com. And if you want more information on that, you can go to jaredtendlerpoker.com backslash free. Without further ado, here's my interview with Daniel. Daniel, really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to talk with me today. Uh, so welcome, and uh, I want to just kind of dive in, because I know you've done a ton of interviews, you've shared many, many aspects of, your, uh, of yourself, and I want to kind of focus on self-improvement at first. Uh, it's been become like a big thing for you now, and uh, I wondered like, what really prompted uh, you to get into it uh, more so at this point in your life, and like, was it something that was missing in your life? Was it something that, like, poker had become too big of a priority? Uh, like, how did that how did that start for you? Well, you know, it reminds me of something that Christy Arnett just wrote in her blog, and I can't remember exactly how what the quote was, but it was something to the effect of, she, you know, she has a belief that we're always students of life and we'll never master it. And I'm I've always been very self aware for the most part, and you know, introspective and looking for deeper meaning. This isn't something that's new. Um, and then I think with age and you know comes wisdom, and uh, I did a lot of reading uh, of you know various books that I thought were you know interesting, like um, some Eckhart Tolle stuff. Uh, Power of Now. Uh, you actually know not the, I read that eventually, but a New Earth. I found the okay. New Earth. Be, I found that book to be a lot better. To be honest, it, it talks about the ego um, in a very interesting way, and so that's how I started. You know, reading some books, and then my agent Brian Ballsbog, he did a course in Vegas called Choice Center which most people in poker have probably heard of. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said it was great. You know, you should try it. And I was like, okay, cool. So I did the course. And it's all along the lines of, like, raising your level of emotional intelligence. And I found it to be a very, very powerful way of doing it. Because, well, you know, I get a lot from reading. And I, I'm, you know, analytical in that way. There's just no substitute for experiencing something as a memory or as a, you know, an exercise. Um, and, you know, there's scientific studies that show that, Many, mo a lot of brains, more, more so, that more than most, uh, respond to experience more than they would, you know, just reading a book. So, self improvement wasn't something that just kind of happened. It's something that's been a kind of lifelong journey for you. Uh, what, what do you feel like has been kind of the biggest takeaway uh, in that pursuit of late? I mean, obviously, it's given you things at different points in your life. Uh, what are you getting from it most recently? Well, I would say there's one thing that sticks out, and that's you know, standing responsible for everything in my life. Like, you know, I believe in, I guess we call like the four levels of responsibility. Level one being, I'm not responsible for anything that happens in my life, right? So that's like a victim mentality victim. where, mm -hmm. yeah, total victim. Like nothing, I can't control anything. It's bad luck, da, da, da. And the truth is people in that level rarely actually want to do anything to change that, right? And then level four is the case where you look at it like I'm responsible for Everything for how I react to events, people, and places like everything, you know. So, a 
car crash that happens across the road, it's not my fault, but I'd rather stand responsible than victim. So what that means to me is responsible for how I respond to it. So whether it was a traumatic experience, like somebody, you know, a 12 year old girl who was raped, not her fault, right? But if she's now a 35 year old woman who's suffering from something that was obviously traumatic, who's responsible for that at that point? It's easy to say, well, the rapist, but I look at it a little deeper and say, at this point in your life, you're responsible 100% for how you react to things. And it's completely understandable. People get like, of course you'd understand why she'd be hurting over it. There's no question. But she's still responsible now for, for her life and how she chooses to live it. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think in a lot of cases, especially people going to therapy, can often be hesitant to talk about their parents in a negative way because they feel like they're blaming their parents when, in fact, they're very often just – understanding kind of the way in which particular issues emerged and taking responsibility for dealing with things that, you know, inevitably will emerge because it's impossible for parents to be perfect. Yeah, absolutely. You know, no matter what, you know, how good of a job you think you're going to do as parents, you're going to mess your kids up a little bit. So, you know, there's a theory that by around the age of seven to eight years old, the majority of your beliefs in terms of who you are and where you stand in the world are formed already. So if you're a 35 year old man, you're being led by beliefs of a seven-year-old boy. So if you had a family that was divorced, you know, your parents got divorced, and at six, seven years old, you decided it's because they didn't love you because you weren't worthy of love. Well, now they're 35, and they might not consciously be aware that that's where the source of it came from, but they may live their life from a place of, like, I'm unworthy of love, and they may self-sabotage or other things like that. So I think there's a lot of value in whether it's therapy or, you know, something like a choice center in digging deep into seeing the source of where it, where, where it came from, and then you can actually you know, do something about it rather than just let it continue to guide you. Absolutely. I mean, understanding causality is, is critical. Um, I, I haven't heard that, that theory before. Uh, what, do you, can you talk a little bit more about the like, beliefs getting formed by age seven? Yeah, well, you know, between, by between like seven to nine years old, uh, I mean, some th- studies have shown that, you know, essentially the majority of your beliefs about the world and who you are and your place are already formed. So, you know, by that point, whatever, and a lot, most of them are self-limiting beliefs. Like, I can't do this, I can't do that. I have a personal example. Um, my father and my brother, big, strong guys, right? My dad was an electrician. My brother can build and fix anything, okay? I was, a little, I was shorter than my brother. He's six foot something already in sixth grade. My mother one day, she asked me to open the screen door and I was fiddling with it and I couldn't seem to open it. And she says, oh, you can't do nothing with your hands. You're all thumbs. Let me do it. So I was a kid and she didn't mean any harm. She said something maybe a little. But at that moment, I decided, OK, so I can't do anything with my hands. And I didn't realize till you know, years later, it's like I don't I can't put a table together. I can't do anything around the house like drywall or whatever. Is it because I'm not intelligent enough? Of course not. It's because I was de- I developed that self-limiting belief. From, from that moment where I decided, I just made the decision that I'm no good at that kind of thing, you know, and it stuck with me. So little things like that form our beliefs, and they're very simple and primitive, I guess you'd say, as a seven-year-old, but when, as you get older, you don't realize that they have a drastic effect on how you view yourself and what you're capable of. Certainly. So so the, the responsibility that you've kind of taken for yourself now, uh, in what respect does that apply to poker? Well, I think it's extremely – it's very applicable to poker because you hear a lot of people talk about poker and they say, you know what? If I was just – if I just ran good in those spots, I'd be okay. And when you hear that, you think, really? What's the power in telling these bad beat and victim stories? How is that going to help you in any way, shape or form? It isn't. The only power you can get, gain is if you come from 100 percent place of pure responsibility. So if you get all your money in with aces and you lose to five deuce, okay, that sucked. It happens sometimes. You know, You did nothing wrong. If you continue to always stand responsible for your results, in the long run, you're going to do just fine. The problem we face is the majority of the time we end up with the victim mentality of like, we're just, I'm just unlucky. You know, I know so many, Mike Mattis is the unluckiest poker player in the world. Just ask him. And you know what? He really is. Why? Because he truly believes it. He can't wait to get rivered. What he doesn't realize though is how often when that flush card comes and somebody bets on the river, he thinks in his mind already, well, the guy must have made the flush because that's how unlucky I am. He makes the fold and the guy was bluffing because he's not really present to the moment. He's stuck in – he's really completely stuck in that victim mentality of like, woe is me. And that holds back tons of poker players from being as successful as they could be. 
Would you would you say that Mike is great at recognizing bad luck and terrible at recognizing instances where he gets good luck? Like, why well, like, is he terrible at both? <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I'd say he's probably better at recognizing bad luck and not understanding that if he has pocket aces in a four way pot and it holds up, that's extremely lucky, Mike. That's very, but you don't see it that way. Yeah. You just think I have aces. I'm entitled. I deserve this. I'm supposed to win. You know, that's another common phrase from our friend Phil Helmuth who will say that often. I deserve it. I'm entitled. No, you're not. You know, it's not, that's not how it works. Yeah, it's amazing because those the the beliefs that you're talking about, the victim mentality, um, they they shape your vision. You you start to interpret what is happening in front of you based on what those beliefs are confirming. In some respects, it's almost uh, confidence boosting, and maybe this is what you're seeing with Mike to have your beliefs be confirmed because in a, in a warped sense of uh, a way, it actually gives you some control. Right. It's level one thinking again. It's back to, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. It, it's because that other idiot called with a bad hand and this dealer is really unlucky for me. It's not my fault. That's an easy, it's, a, it's an easier way to live in a lot of senses that like you're not responsible for anything, but you, you, if you're not responsible for anything, you can't do anything about it. It's just not a powerful way of being. And I find that, like, especially with poker, the only value you can take is if you look at a situation and go, did I do everything right? Analyze the hand. If so, continue to do that. If not, look at better, better ways to play it. Look at more possibilities and, you know, a deeper understanding of maybe what you can do to, to be in a better spot instead of being in that spot. Like, for example, Mike, he'll remember the last bad beat that knocked him out, but he doesn't remember an hour earlier where he missed a key value bet on the river against the guy. He doesn't remember that. That's not as relevant, yep. but that's the thing you could have controlled that may have changed the uh, ultimate outcome. All you can do is focus on, you know, what you have control over. Well, and, and in that analysis where you're saying, you know, determine whether or not you played the hand right. I mean, one of the difficulties with poker is that there's so much short-term variance that it's it's sometimes very difficult to know definitively one way or the other. How do you kind of deal with that that short-term uncertainty? Yeah, I think that's not something I deal with now. I'm 40 years old. I've been playing 20 years. I don't. Really so I did when I was younger. Uh, you know, I mean, basically, you know, you're making plays, you're playing certain hands. I was just developing my strategy. So it took a lot of honest introspection. And really, I think the best way to go about it is feedback from friends. So whatever core group of people you play, you shouldn't be out on this on your own. If you want to be a professional poker player and you're out there by yourself, you're doing it wrong. There's forums you can ask for feedback on hands, but even better is just a core group of friends who you can you know ask for feedback. So listen how I played this hand. What do you think? You think I could have done anything differently? And then have a, have a listen. That's the only way you'll learn to create strategies that actually um, you know are more likely to be correct. So early in your career, were you really critical of those situations or spots where there was some uncertainty or you you weren't yeah I'm really sure whether or not you played the hand incorrect or not. I love those situations. Those are the funnest things in a, in a session. I used to write everything down. So at the end of a session, like usually not in hold them as much because it's a much simpler game. But let's say stud eight or better, which I'm sure a lot of your listeners don't necessarily play. But let's say on fifth street, there's a situation where I have a pair and a low draw. I'm up against a probable low. Now, I might make the bet there and then later go, I don't know if that was the right bet. I think he was the favorite. I'm not really sure. So I'll analyze it, and then I'll, I used to use some software back then. It was really uh, the Mike Carroll Poker Pro, <laughs> ancient. And, uh, and I'd look at the hand and see if you know I was a favorite or not. But those are the most valuable situations, the ones that you're not sure about, because though that's where the learning comes from. So I, I recommend for anyone who's playing a poker session, you could be no limit hold'em. You gotta if you play six hours, you're gonna come up with two, three really tricky spots, at least, where it's really valuable to analyze the crap out of it, and, and you know. Do that with friends and get feedback. That's awesome advice. I mean, one that I I share uh, entirely. That uncertainty basically means that there's something for you to know. I mean, that's the bottom line. It's there's a yeah. uh, it's a huge opportunity there. Um, the mistake poker players make. Sorry to interrupt, but yeah, the mistake poker players make is when they get to a place where they feel like they got it all figured out. You never get it all. You never have it all figured out. If you you have to be open to the fact that you don't know what you don't know, right? That you know, you, you don't you you know what you know. You don't know what you don't know. So at any time you think like you've got it all figured out, you're likely to be surpassed by others who are thinking about the game at a more creative and a deeper level. Well, you close yourself off to the option for learning new things. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and then it's just there's no. It's it, I mean, I'll listen to bad players talk about hands sometimes, 
and I'll learn something. Maybe not, mm. I won't learn about how to play a hand properly, but I may learn a thing or two about the mentality of a beginning player and how he views the game and how I can use that to my advantage later. So it doesn't matter what box the information comes from. You can, you can turn that into value if you choose to. In your experience, what do you think blocks people from wanting to be open-minded like that and continuing to learn? Because I know that you're surrounded by a lot of people who fit that model. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you assess in, in them that, that creates that? Well, there's two things. I would say the most predominant one for sure is an, the ad absolute addiction to being right. Uh, for the most part, people are addicted to being right rather than um, you know, being open-minded to the possibility that you know, maybe there is a different way. Nope, this is how you play aces. That's it. You always raise 5x under the gun. That's just the way it is. Or you, you never limp. You do. The, whenever you talk about never and always, <laughs> you're already to go. You know, walking down the wrong path. You know, being open to just the possibility that you know it might make sense to play to veer from from your original strategy. The second one was lost my train of thought, but it was yeah, lost it. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> you're uh, uh, now I'm forgetting uh, Rick. Your Rick Perry moment from the debates. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So. Uh, kind of moving on a little bit, you were player of the year at the World Series in 2004. Nine years later, you do it again, uh, and then you've, you're in contention again this year. What what do you believe is uh, the things that have allowed you to thrive in kind of the pre- and post-internet boom era? Well, I think the, the number one thing is I've always had a very uh, goal-oriented approach to everything in my life. Uh, when I'm not setting goals or striving to be better at something, then I'm in a complacent place and I'm not as happy. So I've always been a goal setter. With poker, it's usually in January that I set, set out goals for the, for the whole year. And um, I typically stick to them very, very rigorously in terms of accomplishing them. With the World Series of Poker, the Player of the Year Awards, I've always liked, ever since the late 90s when I started playing these Player of the Year Awards, I've, I love them. Player mm. of the Series, it's just fun. Because, you know, a tournament's a tournament. There's tons of those. But, like, you know... Having the best run over an extended period is something that's important to me. How I've been able to keep up is, I think, self-awareness of understanding where my game is at in, rel in relation to the others. And if it needs improvement or, or tweaks, I I'm willing to bite the bullet, be humble, and go, okay, let's, let's try a different way. I don't assume that my way is the only way and that it always will be. Where, where did that ethic come from? Good question, you know. Um, you know, it's easy to say your parents, but I don't know. I just feel like I've always had a competitive spirit. I've always just been, you know, as a child, a pretty competitive guy um, and wanted to succeed and win. So it's just, that's just the makeup of myself. I wouldn't really attribute it to my parents, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe perhaps it was a, a little brotherly rivalry then. The... No, definitely not. No. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if we can kind of get into a little bit of like detail here about like what you're doing to, to really be enhancing your game? Is it something where, I mean, you've talked about uh, talking with, with friends and really kind of analyzing critically your game, being aware of what's going on, but, I mean, are you using, like, equity calculators? Are you, uh, you know, continually reviewing hands? Is it something that you're doing daily? Is it something that you do more intensively at certain periods of time? Like, how does that actually work? We can't... Well, when I was doing that, I'm not doing that now, and, and one of the re key reasons is at this point in my career, you know, I'm 40 years old, um, I have a good understanding of the game and what needs to be done. So the most important aspect of success for me is my mental approach. Hmm. So I spend 95%, 98% of my, my, my time on being mentally prepared. And one of the ways I do that is by journaling, uh, you know, writing out kind of what my plan is for the day. And, you know, I get mocked on Twitter and it's fine. I, I understand it because they just don't really understand what I'm saying. Is like I'll make my intention, intention clear. So... When I join, when I enter a tournament, I write out my intention is to win this tournament. My intention is to end day one with this position in chips. My intention is to make the final table as a chip leader, and I, I feel like there's value in speaking it out. Now, that could be problematic for someone if, let's say, you said my intention is to end day one with eighty thousand in chips, and now you're sitting on seventy-two thousand, fifteen minutes to go. If you're attached to that result, you have a problem. So it's not goal setting. I don't really care what I end up with. I'm not attached. But I'd like to be in a good position. So I might deem 80,000 to be a good position, right? If I end up with 72, I don't start making plays to get myself to 80. So you're not rigidly attached to that number. You're more attached to the intention of, as you said, being in a good position. Sure. I'm and not attached to the number in any way, shape, or form. Essentially, what I do is, you know, depending on the stage of the tournament, I usually 
at the end of day one like to have 100 big blinds going into day two because 100 is a very comfortable number. So I'll, I'll just speak out a number. Sometimes I hit it. Sometimes I don't. I'm not, I don't feel failure if I do or don't. It's different than a goal. You know, if I'm saying I'm trying to run an eight-minute mile, mm -hmm. that's a clearly defined thing where you know, you're either going to succeed or fail. If I get busted out of a tournament short of the goal of winning it, I don't feel like I failed. Having said that, by intentionalizing and by, be, by being clear about what I want to accomplish in the day, I feel there's value in that. Whatever it is, let's say you don't play poker, for example. You wake up in the morning. What is your intention for the day? Your intention is to make a difference for your wife. Your intention is to do a great job at work. Your intention is to you know, exercise and make sure you get, a, get in a good workout. I see lots and lots and lots of value of writing that out in a journal in the morning or even speaking it out to somebody or just thinking about it. And then if you don't come up, you know, with, if you don't do what you, you, you expected to do, then Clearly, that wasn't you know, your intention in a lot of cases. Yeah, you know, it's interesting to bring this up because I, I was I was going to ask you also about your goals because I know you, you it's your annual tradition of, of doing that and you know in reading through them they tend to be very results oriented but the way that you're describing it now is that it's much more about intentionality and I think the thing that perhaps is like embedded in there like when you say that there's a ton of value to me it feels like the value is that it creates uh, the target and then the target means that you have to figure out how to achieve it and 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 that you're really you really are more focused on the how and like the process side of things yeah no that's definitely a way you could put it like i'm focusing on the end goal right what is it so why am i doing this why am i playing this tournament like why am i here what is what is my ultimate goal here and i like to make it clear so my goal is to win this tournament i'm starting from there and i go backwards rather than start from the beginning i yeah. do it the other way goal is win so then i'm going to revert back and then I'm going to work out the mechanisms and the approach as to how. Because there's more than one way. So, for example, if my intention is to walk from here to the other side of the room, right? That's my intention, to get to the other side of the room. How many ways can I accomplish that? <laughs> right? Hundreds, millions. I could jog. I could hop. I could roll. I could roll. I could, you know, I could skip. There's so many different ways to get there. But the key is I know what it is I want, where, I, where it is I want to go and what I want to accomplish. Start there and work back. Couldn't have said it better. I mean, I, I think so many poker players end up just focusing on the end result or they do the opposite and it becomes sort of this like equivalent of life is a journey and not a destination, which I think is really misguided. It's like then you're, you're so focused on process and quality without having the containment that's really directing that quality towards something. Yeah, exactly. Like keeping your eye on the ball, essentially. Like, um, you know, I, I got Ben Yu and some of the other poker players, they've come up to me and they said, you know, I feel like the way that I approach it is I just play every single hand the best way that I can. And in theory, that's great. And, and, and that there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But I'd also say there's nothing wrong with saying, for what reason? Exactly. Why are you doing that? Why are you there to play every hand? What is your goal? Is your goal to finish eighth? Is your goal to just hang out? What is your actual intention for what you want to see happen? And some people, it's, it's a really difficult thing, I think, for a lot of minds to grasp, and it was for me too. I was very resistant to all this stuff because I thought it was more detrimental than good, and that's true with a lot of players. But now I see that, uh, you know, putting out that message to the universe, if you will, you know, uh, get all kooky, high-end, new agey, um, I see the value. And, I, you know, some people, I haven't read The Secret or anything like that, but they call it Law of Attraction or, any, or something along those lines. Um, I have seen the value in that, not just in my poker results, but in my personal life and other you know achievements that I've uh, been able to attain. Uh, again, probably could have done that stuff without saying my intention is to win, but I do believe that it's I, you're, it, it increases my chances ever so slightly at, at the very least. Yeah, I mean, I I think just to to play devil's advocate with like the secret stuff because I the the difficulty that I have with it is that. It sort of changes the nature of the game. The game then becomes who's the one that kind of is more attached to their intention rather than like the actual skill that's kind of playing out on the poker table. And and so to me, what you're describing is that you have 100% focus on that that outcome, on the what you need to do to achieve that outcome. And And there's a lot of things that occur when you're playing at a really high level. Like when you're in the zone, which it sounds like you are doing at a very high rate, you're absorbing unconscious data. And that unconscious data creates insight and you're able to make decisions at a very high level in ways that are not always conscious. And, and that's the kind of stuff to me that I look a little bit more scientifically at 
to explain what it is that you're capable of doing rather than it being the the universe kind of conspiring to uh, give you this uh, victory because you've been creating such a strong intentionality but it's more like the, the byproduct of intentionality the byproduct of having really high focus means that your your mind is operating at such a high level that as a result of that compared to most of the people you're playing against uh, you have an edge just for that reason alone no absolutely and, and you, know, you know along with that from an analytical standpoint, you know, so you have your intention, which is to say, say, win the tournament. Now, from an analytical standpoint, you can ask yourself, is what you're doing in line with the vision that you have and your yeah. intent? So, for example, if my intention is to win the tournament and it's 6 a.m. and I'm drinking beers with my friends and the tournament's at noon, is that in line with my intention? Is my intention really clear? If, if all that mattered to me in the world was winning that tournament, would I be doing that? If I was giving him my absolute best, would I be out at the bar? Would I be not getting sleep? Would I, you know, be on my iPad and all those things? No. So clearly, if though if you're doing those things, your intention is not clear because the actions that you're taking are not in line at all with the vision you have for yourself. So I like to work back, have the intention, and then I ask myself, is this in line with the vision I have for my life or for for this tournament? Am I am I am I doing what I say I, I want to be doing? Yeah, which which speaks to a lot of responsibility uh, and. I would conceptualize it as a conflicting goal. People show to show up. On the one hand, they want to look good. They don't want to make mistakes. Uh, they don't want to fail. Uh, and so those intentionalities sometimes create behaviors like that where they'll, as you said before, like self-sabotage in a way that's not necessarily something that they're aware of. But staying out drinking till 6 a.m. doesn't feel like such a problem when deep down you're not fully committed to winning because there are those conflicting motives. You reminded me of my number two just now. Ah. <laughs> it was a looking good conversation. Okay. So that's, you know, you were asking earlier what the, what are the things that hold people back from, you know, doing those types of things. And the looking good conversation, you know, a lot of players face this, you know, whether it's going to be on television and all of a sudden people on 2 plus 2 are going to make fun of you for making a play. If you have a looking good conversation ahead of your intention, you're already at a huge disadvantage, Right. Or if you don't want to share with other people because you don't want to sound stupid. Actually, Christy Arnett's blog recently, she talked about that, where she didn't want to share hands because she didn't want people to make fun of her. You know, And often people lie. They tell, they tell somebody about a hand, but they lie about what they had. Yeah. Or they lie about the action because they don't want to look stupid. So you know, Vanessa Selps is a perfect example of someone I would say that has no looking good conversation whatsoever. And it's one of the reasons she's as successful as she is. She doesn't give a crap. If she's seven bet all in with five deuce offsuit and everyone laughs at her for being an idiot – she doesn't care. She makes the play she believes is best so that she will end up successful in the end. She doesn't care what anyone else thinks. And that is like such a valuable asset and a confident place to come from. So having a looking good conversation is, is something that holds players back uh, by a, in, in great numbers. Yeah, and it goes right to what you were saying earlier about the many different ways to get to that outcome. You know, I, I know you're a big golfer. I, I am as well. And that's the beauty of golf as well. Golf and poker are similar in this regard. There are many ways to skin a cat. There are tons of different ways to swing the golf club. Uh, and many ways to play a particular hole and play it well. Uh, so just because w one way works for another and has the potential for being criticized because somebody else does it differently, you know, it, it almost sort of speaks more to the person who is criticizing about who they are rather than the one who's kind of receiving that criticism. And with, you know, I would say specifically with tournament poker, it's a really important thing uh, to understand is that if your goal is to be accepted and look good and play like everybody else, that's very average. And you're going to end up with very average results, meaning you're coming in 17th, you're min cashing, you're not succeeding. It's those people that are willing to veer from what is considered, you know, the traditional ABC strategy and, and take risks that they know full well could come back and haunt them or that people are going to mock and look like they're stupid. If you're not willing to do that, you will play just like everybody else and you will be just as break-even, slight loser as everybody else. You know, Vanessa has her own unique way of creating value for herself by playing far from the ABC standard that's taught in books or online, right? I have my own way, very different than hers, but I veer. I play certain hands that you know, people can, oh, five, seven suited, he's calling a three bet, that's bad. Okay, if you're going to stick in that box mm -hmm. where you're so limited in terms of looking at a play in a vacuum and saying this is bad and not understanding the context of what it can create for me later or the history, then you're just not thinking about poker at a level that's going to make you exceptional. So 
I want to talk about the concept of self-belief, which is obviously very related to our conversation today. And this is something we kind of chatted about very briefly on Twitter, and Twitter is not really a great place for deep conversations. Um, and you've said in a few places that, that you believe that your belief in yourself is one of the biggest reasons that you've been so successful. Can you elaborate on, on what you mean by that and why you think that is? Right. So, like, I'm a big believer that if I didn't believe that I could be a successful poker player and a professional, I wouldn't have taken it on and I wouldn't have put in the work. Similar to like, okay, there's a 20-foot wall. I look at that 20-foot wall. I don't believe I can actually jump over that wall in any way. If I don't believe that I can, I'm way less likely to put in the work necessary to actually give it a shot and to see that if I could. Whatever it is in life, you know, you, Brad Pitt, before he became like a big-time movie star, he had a belief somewhere that he could accomplish that goal. So I believe there's like, you know, uh, there's, there's belief, then there's action, and then there's result. Doesn't always end in success, but I don't believe that anyone has big success in life without first believing that they actually could. So if you have those self-limiting beliefs, like you cannot be successful at something, you're more likely to be right because we're addicted to being right, and you'll make yourself right. Makes sense. Okay, so there's you're not saying that self-belief is the only thing that has led to your success you're saying that it's one of many factors it's the yeah it's it's the light the first you know spark if you will yeah. that puts you down a journey or a road to get there so because when, but I'm a big believer that if you didn't have the self-belief you the hard work is important right you wouldn't put in the hard work if you didn't think you could believe it if you didn't think you could run a seven second hundred yard dash how much are you are you gonna bother you won't even waste your time. You're not going to put in the work if you don't see it as attainable. If you don't really believe you're going to do it, you're not going to do it. You know, you're, not, you're probably not going to do it anyway. Seven minute miles, a uh, seven minute hundred yard dash is absurd. But the point being, if you don't actually have the belief first that you can accomplish something, I don't believe you're going to put in the same level of work as you would if you did believe you'd accomplish it. Okay, I, that makes sense. And I want to pose a slightly different perspective. And I think part of the reason I want to do this is because I think it, this is not just something that. Um, you know that you're describing. It's also something that I have difficulty with with general sports psychology. Uh, but there's research that has come out recently that talks about like the power of pessimism. And for some people, not everyone, obviously there are people who having that deep sense of belief is really, really important and powerful. But there are people who actually respond to pessimism. And uh, the research they showed actually d was done with uh, dart throwing. So they were able to kind of segment people based on their belief systems. And if you gave people who tended to be more pessimistic, positive reinforcement, their performance actually decreased. And if hmm. you gave people who, uh, you know, responded more to positive uh, affirmations, positive thoughts, pessimistic feedback, then their performance dropped. And obviously the reverse was true. The pessimists aren't necessarily, um, you know, going to work less hard uh, than somebody who's more positive, but it's just sort of their viewpoint of the world tends to be slightly different. And so there is... There is value to pessimism, not again for everybody, but for some people. Hmm, I, that's really interesting. It seems to, I'd have to wrap my head around that one because I don't know that it like fits into sort of the way that I believe things work, but I mean, obviously there's something to it. I, I, it makes, makes me think about another study they did with basketball players. And they had one group of basketball players um, not for 30 days, not shoot a basket, not think about basketball for 30 days, not shoot a free throw. They had another group just think about shooting free throws, like actually visualize doing it for 30 days. Then they had the third group actually just shooting them every day, right? So interestingly enough... And sorry, the, how, how, how skilled were these basketball players? Uh, they were relatively skilled, okay. like college, you know, whatever. Yep. So so now the, the high-end guys, I mean, the ones that were actually throwing, you know, baskets, they they obviously had a big increase, right, in, in their ability to shoot free throws. Mm -hmm. the, the ones that didn't do anything saw a slight decrease in their ability. The ones that thought about it, just thought about it, didn't take one basketball shot, actually performed better than they had the month before, just from thinking about it. So they didn't form as well as those actually doing the practice, but the visualization was better than doing nothing. Yes. Which lends itself to believing that, you know, even the thought of something or, of, of, like, can actually help, you know, you realize it. So, and I think a combination of both things is valuable. I, I completely agree, and there's, a, there's an asterisk on that visualization which is that it works best for people who already have a lot of skill okay if you don't have skill 
visualizing is not going to produce anything. Like when you're actually visualizing something, it's 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 actually really cool. If you attach electrodes uh, to like those basketball players' muscles when they're visualizing shooting a free throw, their muscular system will fire in the same coordinated pattern as if they're actually doing that. So it's almost yeah. like there's a priming mechanism within the body that they're accessing and, and in essence like training and reinforcing. If that motor program or in poker, if that kind of mental program for decision making, for example, isn't there as solidly as it is for you compared with somebody who's a new a new player, then that visualization is not going to have the same kind of effect. So it's sure. like the, like the greater your skill, the greater visualization can can impact oh, you. And you know that, that makes like logical sense. Like you know Marissa, she just started taking up golf, right? So you know she's hit a, golf, a couple <laughs> golf balls. If she takes thirty days and just thinks about a golf <laughs> exactly. swing, it's not, and she's going to still suck really bad you're not gonna have any improvement you're but she but once you train your muscles and you have that muscle memory now it's something you can actually tap into exactly, exactly. right that makes total sense yeah and I think I, the reason I wanted to clarify this because I think there's as I said there's some sort of misnomers that are out there and and there's one last um, theory that I want to throw out to you one because I think you'll be interested in it two I think it'll be helpful for other people too um, have you ever heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect no it's it basically there are two sides to it one side says that there are people who are overconfident. They have ex- like excessive self-belief because they're so incompetent about understanding their own incompetence. Ah, yeah, that's funny. So that that's like the essence of what a fish is. Right? They they believe they're a great player because they you know one hands against you, but in fact they have so little skill to be able to recognize their lack of skill that they're overconfident. But then on the flip side, you actually have people who are so skilled. But their problem is that they are projecting, uh, like the they're uh, they're projecting the idea that everybody else knows what they know, and so here are people who are, are really really skilled, and they're actually underconfident because they think that what they have isn't isn't actually that special. Mm-hmm. Limit, yeah, no, it sounds like a limiting self belief. Yeah, it, it, and, and in some respects, it's it's a limiting self belief that um, like prevents them from having. Uh, like really good consistent confidence, yeah. but what it doesn't do is prevent them from playing well, and that's you know, that's the, I think some of the key here is that that, yeah. you, that having low confidence doesn't mean that you're going to play poorly, and having high confidence doesn't mean that you'll play well. And you know it's interesting the other example of the fish who's overconfident. I I, I attribute that to a low EQ, low emotional intelligence, because he's lacking self awareness, right? Um, which is something that you know, you, if, if you're, you're you're so overconfident about something you really don't know anything about, where's that come from? That comes from lacking awareness about a, you know, how difficult this is, um, where you stand, not being able to be introspective, um, and I think that, you know, I'm a big believer in elevating your emotional intelligence in various ways. There's not just one way to do it. Mm-hmm. There's books. There's experiential, but I believe that there are five attributes that raise your level of or raise your, increase your chances of having both a happy and successful life that's one where you are goal setting and achieving those goals. Yeah, and, and where, where my head goes at, because I'm you know, trained as a therapist, but also you know, looking at performance, is to say, well, what are the reasons why somebody is going to have those limiting self-beliefs? What are the reasons why they're going to kind of want to be incubated? I think there, there are people who have a desire to sort of stay unconscious, almost like you know, in the Matrix, you know, Cypher wanting to get plugged yeah. back in, you know, not wanting to really be aware. Uh, and and there, if you can kind of tap into an understanding of why it is that a person would want to hold rigidly to that that blindness in a sense, then, you know, you get to start to find some interesting things about them. Well, just like in the Matrix, it's easier, right? He was living in that dream world, eating that steak. He knew it was fake, but he'd rather be there than living in a world that, you know, and I would attribute it to like, Victim versus responsible. When you st- when you become aware that you're responsible, like you're at your you're in you're at a place in your life, 100% based on decisions you've made throughout your life. Right? I understand circumstances happen. Everyone is born with like a different amount of opportunity. But ultimately, wherever you are is based on decisions that you've made. So that's both empowering in the sense that you realize that you can change it, but can also be frightening and scary. Sure. It's people like, oh my god, you know. This is all because of me. So I have control over my life. That can be a, a scary proposition for people. Yeah, and and when you say easier, I think it, they also are not looking at sort of the long term consequences of taking the easy route. You know, if you if you stick your your arms in a sling just because it's easier to walk, 
you know, your muscles atrophy. You know, if you if you're continually doing harder things, you're strengthening muscle, you're developing skill, and and that actually provides you the opportunity to do more things in the future. And I think the the long term value of that is often you know mislooked. I think people kind of sure. fail to calculate the the risk of doing nothing. Right, and risk is a big thing that you know I look to is most people love living in what they what's their comfort zone what they know what they understand don't take any risks you know don't ask this girl out she might turn you down and you'll feel like an asshole you know don't leave your job and take on something bigger and better don't do these things because you're in your comfort zone but the truth is in my opinion all the juice all the beautiful things in life are associated to the risk that is in the realm outside of your comfort zone so by taking these risks and I'm not talking just poker just Mm -hmm. whatever it is in life that holds people back from achieving dreams that they set for themselves is because they're in that comfort zone and they realize to get that dream, it requires risk, right? But that's, in my opinion, when you're not risking and you're not stretching yourself, you're holding yourself back from the very successes and dreams that you claim to want. Yeah, and sometimes they expect to want to take excessive risk or, or think that other people or even themselves, when when sometimes it's just looking at like a steady way of expanding your comfort zone. It doesn't have to always be something that's that's big and dramatic. It can be small kind of baby steps, like uh, sure. like Bill Murray liked, liked to say. Yeah. So if your life was like, a, the way I look at it is like, your li- if your life was like a line, right? And you're at a place in your life. If you continue to do things the same way that you've always done them, then you can only expect that your life will continue on the exact same trajectory it has. Unless you decide to change or take a risk or do something outside of your comfort zone or not, you will see no change. So when people talk about what they want and I wish I had this and that and that, like unless you're actually willing to take the risks in order to achieve those things, you will end up exactly where you've always been. You know, it just there's just I mean, just seems like impossible to to achieve anything without changing the the way that you're doing things in you know the the way that you have been doing things most of your life. Yeah, and and in some respects the 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 logical conclusion too is that things only have the potential to get worse you know as people get older they often accumulate a lot of emotional baggage and so you know those regrets those wishes you know can often weigh on somebody and you know the lack of growth you know you're sort of like you're, you're you're either moving in one direction or the other you know you're growing or you're you're constricting and yeah and you're right like somebody who's 60 years old has got so much more baggage and so many more self-limiting beliefs that it's going to be way more difficult to to you know, change all those beliefs or to address them than it would be you know a twelve or thirteen year old kid who's just starting his life out, and that's why I'm a big believer in you know emotional intelligence being taught to teenagers. Yeah, they're forming their their views on the world, like they're so empowered by realizing that they have choice. Uh, I think that it's really really valuable to, to teach it in schools. You know, not necessarily in a very very intense level, like you may see at some of the trainings that I've done, like at Choice Center, but something like a little softer that opens them up to realizing that they have the power to be whatever it is they want to be. And I think it's really cool that you have been keeping a journal and, and use one for a very long time. It's something that I advocate. I've, I've done it myself for uh, at this point over, over 16 years. So it's, it's an incredible tool and I love the fact that you're advocating for it. And uh, Daniel, I realize how long we've been talking and I think we could keep going on, but I realize your time is precious and uh, I want to thank you very much for, for the conversation. It was really insightful and, and, and pretty enjoyable. All right, man, it was fun. Thanks again to Daniel for coming on the show and sharing his perspective. It was certainly a conversation that I really enjoyed, and I hope all of you enjoyed listening to it and got some things uh, out of it. Uh, If you're interested in an article I wrote about the power of pessimism, go to jaredtendlerpoker.com, look for my blog, and look for the entry about this podcast. There's a link for that article, The Power of Pessimism, uh, in that post. That is it for today's show. I want to thank you all for listening, and I'll be back real soon with more great guests and more high-level discussion about the mental game of poker.